Why? Members of the Manpower Panel, thank you for attending on time. We have a quorum and we can start the meeting today. First, item one. Now, since last meeting, the certain information documents have been issued. Uh, in fact, there hasn't been any document received. And next meeting date and items for discussion. You can refer to the outstanding items for discussion. CB bracket 2, 971, slash 2021 bracket 01, and uh, follow up uh, items. Uh, CB bracket 2, 971, slash 2021 bracket 02. These have been sent to members. Now, the regular meeting for May 2021 will be on the 18th of May, Tuesday afternoon, 4.30 p.m. The Labour and Welfare Bureau proposes to discuss the following items. A. Occupation notice. Uh, the implementation of the reimbursement of maternity leave pay scheme. B. Occupational disease and occupational health situation. And C. Report on the consultancy study uh, item 16, uh, Hong Kong's uh, Occupational Safety Performance 2020. That's the uh, on the outstanding items for discussion. Now, as discussed uh, at the regular meeting, the government will uh, discuss uh, the uh, uh, cancellation of the offsetting arrangement of the MPF scheme. But in fact, that will be uh, discussed uh, at every meeting. And in fact, it uh, overlaps with item number six, uh, that is, uh, the abolition of using employers' and mandatory contributions under the MPFS to offset severance payment and long service payment. So uh, we will discuss that when we come to item 6, the Labour and Welfare Bureau. The Secretary will report to us and we come to the next item, uh, item number uh, four, four uh, major findings of the 2020 annual earnings and hours survey. We have with us Ms. Agnes uh, Low Kid Mu, assistant. Uh, we have with us a representative from the Census and Statistics Bureau and the uh, and now, the uh, report has been uh, announced, uh, and uh, this is in the document uh, as has been established and distributed to members. And the uh, administration will use a PowerPoint to explain the uh, situation. Now, there are uh, quite a number of items for discussion today. We hope that we can all be succinct. Uh, can we limit that to 10 minutes? Yes. Uh, so we invite uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Agnes Lowe, uh, Assistant Commissioner of CNS, to brief us. First, very briefly on our methodology on coverage. Basically, we cover all the major occupations, all the establishments irrespective of size and number of employees, and uh, so we exclude government employees. Uh, so uh, otherwise, we cover all the uh, employees under the minimum wage ordinance. Now, uh, the period of uh, survey that's uh, made to June 2020, uh, so that's uh, the usual period. Uh, April, uh, May to June. And as in the past, we cover about uh, 10,000 establishments covering over 60,000 employees. Now, a major item of data uh, is the monthly wage. Now, 
uh, we use the definition of wage under the uh, employment ordinance and we get the data on the employee's total wage wages received during the period. Now, if there are rest days, there are wage, wages, and uh, uh, if there is meal time that are not part of work hours uh, and we receive a wage, that's also included. Now, the uh, results are in this PowerPoint. Uh, the median wage, uh, monthly wage, uh, 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 10,800, uh, 8,400, that's a 1.4% increase. Now, that's the uh, lowest uh, since the implementation of the statutory minimum wage, and, uh, but that's still uh, higher than the consumer price index, which is 1.1%. Now, uh, the 10th percentile is $9,600. That's uh, uh, a drop of 3.9%. That is the uh, first decrease, uh, annual decrease since the implementation of the SMW. Now, this shows the uh, situation by uh, sex, education, and uh, age. Now, for male, uh, that's a minimum wage, that's uh, 20,900. Uh, 9, uh, female, 16,200, the difference of about 20%. This is similar uh, difference as in previous years. As for different age groups, now uh, for the 35 to 44 age group, the median wage is 21,400. That's the highest among the groups. Uh, second is 25 to 34 age group. And in third place, uh, 45 to 54, and then 55 uh, or more, and then uh, 15 to 24. This is in the same order as in previous years. On education, it's very clear. Uh, the higher the education, uh, the higher the median wage. And then uh, we uh, classify the uh, into five groups uh, according to uh, occupation. And in, uh, so those engaged in craft and uh, uh, machine operators, and uh, uh, that's the third group, and then the service workers, their median wage, uh, they uh, fell by 2.6% uh, and 2.8% respectively. Uh, that's the first time uh, we recorded decrease. For the other groups, there were increases, but the increases were lower than. Now, uh, by occupation, now we see that uh, uh, according to the 2019 to 2020, the SMW Commission, the four low wage categories uh, retail, uh, catering, uh, property management, security, and cleaning, and the miscellaneous, these are the four uh, low wage groups. And in 2020, uh, the overall uh, median wage is uh, 13,400, that's a 1.1% drop uh, year on year. As for the others, uh, an increase of 1.2%. Now, this is also the first time we see a decrease for low wage categories. Uh, and uh, the 1.2% for the other occupations, that's also a relatively low uh, increase. Now, apart from uh, monthly wage, another uh, item of data that we refer to is the hourly wage. We follow the uh, SMW ordinance, the uh, definition on the wage payable. Now, the formula is simple. Uh, now, uh, for the numerator, that's the uh, total uh, wages received during the period, uh, less the uh, rest day wages, and uh, the uh, mealtime uh, wage that are not part of work hours. And the denominator is the total work hours during the period. Now, if under the contract uh, there are some meal hours that are regarded as work hours, that would be included in the denominator. In 2020, now for all uh, employees, uh, uh, that's uh, 
uh, there's a 1.8 percent uh, increase, and that's uh, also higher than the uh, overall consumer price index, 1.6 percent. But we like to point out <coughs> that for the fifth percentile, that's in the first row, uh, for 2020 compared to 2019, there was no increase. Now, for the 10th, uh, 25th, uh, 75th, and uh, uh, 90th percentile, they were increases over the years. Now, for the lower uh, groups, uh, the year-on-year uh, 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 -year increases are lower. This differs slightly from in previous years. And then in 2020, uh, uh, the uh, statutory minimum wage, uh, 3750 uh, those who earn that wage, uh, that's uh, 16,500, 0.6% uh, 6 of the total, uh, that's uh, 4,700 less than previous year. And in percentage, that's a uh, decrease of 0.1%. Now, for, uh, for males, the median wage is $83 and uh, female $66. Uh, that's a uh, similar uh, difference uh, tw about 20% as for monthly wage. Now, uh, this is also similar difference as in previous years. No major change. Now, as for different age groups, now the hourly wage, med uh, median wage, hourly median wage, uh, the order is similar to 2019, and this is also st similar to the monthly wage. Uh, 35 to uh, 44, they have the highest uh, wage, uh, medium wage, and, uh, and then uh, uh, 25 to 34, and then uh, 45 to 54. Now, uh, on education, uh, now the higher the education, the higher the median hourly wage. And for uh, occupations, now, the order is that uh, for non-technical workers, the hourly wage is the lowest among the five groups, and the for highest, that's the manu managerial uh, professional grade. Uh, that's also similar to the situation in previous years. Now, for 2020, uh, highest hourly median wage, uh, the education and public administration, uh, public utilities, uh, and uh, 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 prevention of contamination, and then fourthly, construction. Now, uh, similar to, that's similar to uh, 2019. And for hourly wage, a median hourly wage, the lowest uh, four groups, that's property management, miscellaneous activities, catering, uh, retail, uh, that's similar, uh, that's, in fact, that's the same order as in 2019. Now, uh, these are the four low-wage categories as identified by the SMW Commission. Now, uh, now for the work hours, uh, we follow the uh, uh, minimum wage ordinance uh, definition uh, that includes uh, the agreed hours under the contract uh, and overtime. Now, uh, for the 25th percentile, 50th percentile, that's the median rate, and the 75th percentile, the hourly work, uh, weekly work hours decreased uh, from 2019, uh, decreased by 22.0 to 2.8 percent. Now, for this PowerPoint, uh, this supplies some supplementary information. Now, uh, we uh, did a uh, uh, overall uh, household survey to uh, collect the data, uh, but. Uh, this refers to the uh, seven days prior to the interview, the total work hours from all work carried out. Uh, so if uh, there are more than one jobs, it's all covered. This covers both paid and unpaid hours, but excluding the meal hours and also the hours that are the fall on rest days or off days. Now, a piece of supplementary information, because when we have these surveys, they, these two surveys actually cover different things. So you cannot make an apple to apple comparison. So when you look at the composite household survey, there has been a decrease in working hours. Now turning to the low wage sectors, 
weekly working hours will see a decrease, roughly 3.4 to 3.8 percentage. Property management miscellaneous activities while working hours stayed roughly the same. That's roughly in line with the overall trend. We also looked at the those getting ra a rather low hourly pay, the change over the two years. 2020 and 2019, if we compare the figures, those who had a lower wage than the fifth or 25th between the 5th and the 25th percentiles, the hourly pay stayed roughly the same without major change. So that's it for my brief introduction. Now we open the floor to questions. First, Mr. Vincent Chang. Four minutes question and answer inclusive. Chair. Now this report compares May and June 2020 to the same months in 2019. Apart from the those at the grassroots, pay for the other workers saw a slight increase. But has the impact of the employment support scheme be reflected? Because this reference period was actually covered by the ESS scheme. Was the ESS scheme playing any part in or having any impact on the wage levels? When we gathered the data, we looked at the reference period as a reference period May and June 2020. We looked at the take home wage, whether there was the ESS or not. We didn't really. So this is really just about the take home wage. So here's my concern. If the government is look taking the information as the basis of policy making and the ESS wasn't reflected. So how valuable is the information? Has there been information reflecting the difference made by the ESS scheme? Assistant Commissioner, we do the survey annually and shortly we will kick start the survey for the 2021 and when then we will see how things are in May and June 2021. But for the latest figures, you can look at the labor survey. It's another survey done monthly. The coverage will be narrower. Uh, they focus on the low skilled workers, those below the level of supervisors. The latest figures cover the fourth quarter of 2020. We can see the wage change from quarter to quarter, moderate changes. We have to wait till the end of June to see the Q1 figures from 2021. Chair, my concern is that last year there was the ESS, and I hope the government will not take the ESS as an excuse for saying, look, there's little change in wage levels. Now, I have a concern about no pay leave. It's common this year. Is that reflected? in working hours and is there any sector that has been disproportionately affected by no pay leave? Assistant Commissioner, please. When we gather the data, now if there was agreement between the employer and the employee for no pay leave in May and June, then for sure that would have had an impact on the total monthly earnings and monthly working hours. In 20 20 in terms of monthly earnings and working hours there was a drop compared to the previous years and from other data in 2020 given the poor economic environment there were many job losses especially among the low skill post positions so Sectors that rely heavily on such workers, say food and beverage, you can see these sectors being disproportionately affected. Mr. Vincent Cheng, any follow-up questions from you? No. Uh, Mr. Ronick Chen. Thank you, Chair. Given COVID, look at the food and beverage, construction, courier, accommodation services. We see a drop in the medium increase, more than 1.5% increase. We, we know why. 
but for other sectors, professional services, science, technical activities, education, and financing, they have been relatively spared by COVID. So their median income actually saw a slight positive growth. But for real estate activities, it's interesting. They have been relatively spared. If I look at the land registries, purchase and sale figures, from 5,800-ish to more than 7,000 in December. But from a table, I see the median wage of those engaged in real estate construction. They actually saw the sharpest drop 5.4% in their median earnings. Has the Census and Statistics Department find out why? Is it that the construction sector, we don't feel they have been hit hard, but they have experienced the worst drop in their median wage. Why? Is that the case? Second, in table two, the monthly wage of male workers to 20,900. That's 4,700 higher than those for female workers. Last time at the panel, the government gave us a brief explanation. So there were different training programs to, inc to improve the employability and competitiveness of female workers. But based on the May, and June figures from 2020, male workers saw a 0.7% increase in wage, but the female workers they saw a higher percentage increase in earning, more than 1%. Does that mean the government has met its target in terms of its training programs of women? Has the government made reference to practices elsewhere to further close the gap between the earnings of men and those and that of women. Uh, take the question about workers in the real estate first. Why the sharp drop in median wage? In 2020, the property market was relatively subdued, especially in the secondary property market. Sentiment was poor. So those in the sector, especially agents, they saw a drastic decrease in their income. Apart from hourly wage, they also saw their working hours slashed, and hence the sharp decrease in their earnings. Now turning to the disparity between the earnings of men and that of women, there were many factors behind such gap. As for the government's measures to close the gap, I want to invite my colleague from the Labor Department to tell us more about this. The Labor Department, please. As the Assistant Commissioner from the Census and Statistics Department has told us, wages are affected by many factors. This is just about the take-home wage of employees in particular months. I believe the government will have all sorts of measures to help women re-enter the job market and enhance their competitiveness. Thank you, Chair. Chair. Last time, they told us about the phenomenon, the disparity. But training was the only thing they offered about closing a gap. Now, apart from continuing with the training, but have you drawn on the experience practices of other places, apart from stepping up training for women? Are there going to be other kinds of measures say, actively bring in women, in, say, in disciplined forces, actively bring in women, that might help boost the earnings of women. Anything to elaborate, to add from the Labor Department? I want to thank Mr. Chen for his comments. We will take his comments back to the relevant bureaus. Mr. Ronick Chen. There is no further question that I have a few questions for the government. This is about the annual earnings and hours survey. There's always a lag between the data and the position of things. And that's a glaring lag this year. Two years ago, in mid-2019, black clad violence started and COVID started last year, early last year, and now we're in mid April 2021, the economy has never picked up. The job position 
has deteriorated. So the data you have here do not reflect the full extent of the impact of all these developments. So here's my concern. Shrinking labor force. From the 6th of April 2020, compared to the year before, we saw a drop of 250,000 of the labor population. Uh, the secretary explained why maybe they're part of it was that we had, we had fewer part-time students, domestic helpers, etc. But there are also people retiring early, or those who have decided to get out of the job market and stay to stay home and look after family members. So there is a latent or rather hidden unemployment issue here. My question for the Census and Statistics Department, do you have any figures about these people, about this kind of hidden unemployment? Now, we also have this issue about the deteriorating employment position of the grassroots. Now we saw some, the figures show some pickup, but look at those receiving the lowest wage, $9,600 per month, compared to 2019, a drop by 3.9% in their monthly wage, not only falling behind inflation, but actually a decrease. What does that mean? That means given this economic environment, the low wage labor are being exploited, having to live with a lower wage. But the labor department, can you tell the commissioner at the minimum wage commission, they didn't do anything and just allow the minimum wage commission to come to the conclusion of freezing the minimum wage. The labor sector condemns the inaction of the commissioner of labor. If there's no consensus, the government just sits on its hands and cites the lack of consensus as the excuse, the reason for freezing the minimum wage. Things are set to look worse next year, because once you freeze the minimum wage, the grassroots will be earning a wage further close to the minimum wage, dropping further to the minimum wage. I hope I'm wrong on this. I'm hoping against hope, but things are probably going to look worse. The government has done a poor job, and that's why I'm blasting the government. A question for the CNSD. There is something that's puzzling. The monthly wage, the median monthly wage by industry. There is an industry, travel, tourism, reservation, and related activities. The wage inch downward by 0.7%. But look at those in the travel sector, they will find this baffling. Look at tour guides, they have had zero income, that's for many of them. Then how come we're having such a slight decrease in their earnings? In terms of hourly wage, that's just a drop of 0.2%. Assistant Commissioner, can you tell us what's what's worth the methodology? Is it because many have left the sector, so they're not counted in the figures? Indeed, last year, many tour guides may have switched to a different sector, and if that's the case, then they wouldn't their wages wouldn't be counted according in. The sector may and some have lost their jobs and that's not reflected in our data because we are focusing on people who managed to hold on to their job at the time of the reference period for travel agencies tour guides part of their pay was i mean let's put it this way some of it wasn't guaranteed pay it could fluctuate. So they were not included under our definition of wages. Because the pay they're taking could fluctuate. Now you also raised a question about the labor force. Indeed, there has been a drop. But a drop has to do with two factors. First, a population, a shrinking population, and second, lower rate of participation accounting for the drop in labor force and their population drop as the commissioner told us 
they live in Hong Kong, but they would travel to Shenzhen to work. They used to be part of our population and our labor force. But due to COVID, these people may have decided to live outside Hong Kong. And hence, they're not reflected in our population and labor force data. And as for the participation in the labor force, a change varies from age group to age group. For the younger age groups, we saw a slight decrease in their participation level. But for the older age groups, there has been a minimal change at best in their level of participation. Maybe uh, the economic, the principal economist can tell us more about this in a bit. And as for hidden unemployment, in tallying the unemployment figures, some people are now out of a job, but they do want to get a job, but they haven't been actively trying to look for a job because they're thinking they won't be able to find it even if they try. And these are unemployed out of frustration. Uh, they are already accounted for in the unemployed population. <coughs> Now, the government economist side, uh, do they have to supplement? As Ms. Lowe has uh, elaborated on uh, a lot, now for the middle of uh, 2020, for each age group, the labor participation rate uh, actually fell. Now, as for the most recent situation, the overall working population decreased, but there were also some positive changes. For some age groups, the participation rate increased year on year. To a certain extent, it shows that some people previously left the labor force and then returned to the labor market. Uh, next, uh, uh, Ms. Yong Hua Yan, we, uh, we will talk about uh, short duration and short working hours. Oh, we are discussing the uh, uh, work hours uh, and earnings. I have several questions. Uh, first, about the uh, differences between male and female. Uh, as Mr. Chen referred to. Now for the monthly wage and hourly wage. Now for the hourly wage, uh, for the male-female distinction, male 83, uh, female $66. So uh, a decrease, uh, a, a difference of almost 20%. Has the government any way to uh, equalize the wages between the sexes because the difference is very large. For the service industries, there are more females in the sales force. The uh, hourly wage is $53.70 per hour. Now, and for the females in the service industry, now uh, for those who work less than 80 hour, 18 hours per month, most of them have to uh, take care of their family members and so on. So maybe is that the reason why they have little bargaining power so that their wages are low? So I'd like to ask uh, the Labor Department whether that's been the result of their studies. Now, as Assistant uh, Commissioner for CNS he explained, there are many factors involved, and it's not unique to Hong Kong. Now, uh, we, in an earlier meeting through the uh, retraining, Employee Retraining Board, the government uh, introduces uh, uh, more flexible uh, workout arrangements to encourage women to join the labor force. Uh, there is greater support for families to encourage uh, women to uh, re-enter the labor market. 
But the difference is 20 percent. Have you compared with previous years? Is 20 percent difference in 2020? Is it a wider or narrower uh, gap compared to earlier years? Now, the surveys show that uh, 2009 to 2020, over the period, the male-female wage difference, whether it's monthly or hourly, uh, the gap is about the same, maybe uh, 1 to 2 percent uh, variation uh, from year to year. So. The government hasn't done its job in trying to equalize the wages. Now, uh, maybe uh, the, uh, the government hasn't come up with a policy or it hasn't implemented a proper policy to deal with the situation of uh, same uh, uh, different pay for the same work. <coughs> now. What can you do to equalize the wages, whether it's monthly or hourly? Have you talked to the major employers, those in the business sector? Anything to supplement from the Labor Department or the CNS? We will uh, reflect the members' views to the policy bureaus. This is a question that we ask at every meeting every year. You have shown us no uh, approach to improve on this difference, and we also don't uh, compare well with our neighboring jurisdictions and economies. Next, uh, Ho Den Chao. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to point out some uh, anomalies in the findings. Now, the chairman asked the first question. Uh, the tourism industry on the uh, uh, tour agents, now the uh, wage decline is very small. That's not what we observe. Now, most of them are suffering in this period, but the administration said that the reason is some have left the occupation, so they are not included. <coughs> so I think the administration has to explain further to the public, otherwise people would uh, suspect that you underestimated the numbers, but you excluded those who left the occupation. Now, secondly, uh, what I'm wondering about is that in the uh, among the occupations now, property management, security, and cleaning workers, now they have the lowest median wage among other among the various occupations or industries. Now, uh, property management, security, and cleaning. Now, uh, these uh, workers should be employed during this period uh, because uh, uh, the industry is not in such a situation that uh, jobs are no longer uh, uh, maintained. Now, now, even for retail, now, maybe some retail establishments have uh, reopened. The uh, median uh, wage uh, is higher than that for property management. So we believe, uh, we w one would think that the uh, uh, property management uh, sector would uh, 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 people would be able, workers would be able to keep their jobs, uh, but it, uh, the refindings show that they have the lowest uh, median, median wage. So is it that uh, the, the, so their performance is the worst? Uh, maybe the government assistance hasn't reached this industry. 
because it's very strange. Uh, property management, security, and cleaning workers should be uh, working during this time. But is it that the various uh, employment employee support arrangements haven't benefited these uh, workers? <coughs> now, on the data, now given the economic situation of 2020, the overall number of uh, employees dropped by 8.7%. But the member is right. For property management, actually, uh, they uh, continue to work. Uh, they have the lowest drop in the number employed. For the um, uh, property management, uh, security, and cleaning workers, there has been little change in the number of employed workers. But the median wage is relatively low because uh, most of uh, many of these workers uh, uh, have hourly wage similar to the statutory minimum wage, so the median wage hasn't increased a lot. For retail, now uh, it's uh, one of the uh, industries uh, hurt most by the economic downturn. Uh, now, uh, uh, now uh, in the previous year, uh, 270,000, and now it's 220,000 in 2020. So as for the median wage, uh, they have a higher median wage. Uh, uh, they, uh, that's, uh, that has always been the case. They earn a higher median wage uh, than the security and uh, property management and uh, cleaning workers. Now, uh, I uh, have uh, one comment. Now, given uh, this set of findings, we find that for the property management, security and cleaning workers, they uh, earn relatively low wages. So with government support, maybe they are able to keep their jobs. Now we have the ESS. <coughs> Uh, still, they have uh, their median wage is relatively low. So I hope the government provides incentives so that this industry uh, will be able to provide to pay higher wages so that the workers uh, can benefit. Now, can we help? the entire industry? Can we help the workers? <coughs> now, uh, this is our comment on, the, uh, on these uh, uh, findings. Now, uh, I agree with Mr. Holden Chow. Uh, I think the government should do more, uh, especially on the uh, outsourcing arrangements. Now, uh, the government should do more to help them. Uh, next, uh, Xu Kao uh, uh, Thank you, Chairman. Now, uh, the CNS told us that uh, for the retail workers, can you tell us again, uh, 270,000 uh, dropped to 220,000? Yes. I just need to take up the figure. Ms. Agnes Law. Can I get back to you? on that point just in a bit. I need to look for the figure. Mr. Peter Xu, uh, can you proceed to your other questions or comments? Just then, Mr. Holden Chow had an exchange with Ms. Agnes Lowe, because they mentioned the figures from 270,000 to 220,000 people. That's a loss of 50,000 people. That's a huge percentage. Is that the unemployment figure? When you say shrinking size, it doesn't translate into unemployment. It just means there are fewer positions. The 2019, the figure was 270,000 or so. In 20, last year, it was 220%. So the drop was roughly 19%. Now, why the difference? Some have switched to a different sector. Some have indeed been out of a job. Some have been out of the labor force. It's not surprising, as you know, Chair, given the black clad violence. Stores got smashed, and then COVID struck. 
many stores shut for good. For retail, I know things have been really rough for them. Uh, we haven't been able to resume cross-boundary tra travel. No tourists around. We only have the local customers. And if co if there's another round of closure because of COVID, then it's going to look even worse. Retail has been hit disproportionately hard. Thank you. I want to thank you for the data. In the paper, CB bracket 2971 stroke 2021 bracket 05. There are people who work for less than 18 hours per week. So those might be called underemployed because they're only employed. Mr. Xu, you're getting ahead of yourself. The paper you refer to belongs to the next agenda item. Sorry, Hong Kong old ones having their fifth anniversary today, so I just need to run. I'm fine if you want to move on to the next item. Are we having the same group of officials taking the answers? But there will be a different set of officials. I'll let you speak first when we move on to the next item. I'll switch to a different action, different question. Just then we talked about the minimum wage. Uh, you condemned the uh, commissioner for labor. Cause they didn't, did anything, didn't do anything, didn't help, didn't stick out for workers. I looked at the median monthly wage in 2020 and 2019. There was a 1.5% increase. I was puzzled. There were fewer jobs outside. And many sectors are suffering. So how come we see an increase in medium wage? Many people had to take a wage cut. Why the increase of 1.5%? We looked at the results, cross-referenced the results from other surveys, and we see consistent results. Uh, despite the poor business sentiment, many companies still offer a pay increase for their own staff, but the increase has been more modest compared to what we saw previously. Now, compared to the year on year increase in 2019, we still see that back then there was more than 3% in increase, but this time around we see just above 1%. companies do there any revision to the pay increase for their own staff. There are also sectors that have indeed offered decent increases in wage, professional, scientific, information technology, finance. These sectors still offer a decent pay increase. Chair, then it makes sense for you to slam the government. There's a time lag between the data showing this survey and what we see in reality, because there is this disparity between what's seen in the data and what's seen on the street. The poor sentiment outside and the moderate increase in wage this time in the data. When you look at those who are not confident enough to look for a job and then you just exclude them from the unemployed population, I think you need to do a better job in designing your surveys. There are people who are not confident enough to look for a job, but you shouldn't discount them from the labor force. I want to clarify a point, Chair. If someone's just getting frustrated, discouraged, and thus chooses not to look for a job, but wants to get a job and capable of taking on a job, available for a job, so to speak, and not tied down because of household chores, and we are counting them in in the unemployment figures. Moving on to the next agenda item. It's about the major findings of the thematic household survey on employees engaged under employment contracts of short duration or working hours in 2019-20. Let's have the government officials enter the room. The government submitted paper and it's tabled logical paper CB bracket 2971 stroke 2021 20, bracket 05. 
the Acting Commissioner for Labor, Ms. Jade Wong, please walk us through the figures. Oh. The Large Coast background brief has also been tabled. CB bracket 2971 stroke 2021 bracket 06. Ms. Jade Wong, please. Thank you, Chair. I want to walk you through the paper here. The Labor Department Commission, the Census and Statistics Department, to commission a survey from October 2019 to January 2020. It was a thematic household study. The data is about those engaged under unemployment con employment contracts with short duration working hours. Employment pattern characteristics, these are things we looked at. The results have been announced. And they have an extract is available in the information paper. I want to invite Ms. Ho to tell us about the highlights from the paper. I'll briefly talk about the key points of the survey. A bit of a background. The last such survey was conducted quite some time ago. And therefore, we have commissioned the CNSD to conduct another survey. For this survey, we're looking, talking about employees who are working for wages, salaries, commission, tips, or payment in kind in the non-government sector and aged 15 or above, including household family helpers, but excluding foreign domestic helpers. On this slide, you can see the highlights of the survey. Roughly 2.93 million people employed by non-government organizations. There are two kinds of such employees. The first one making the vast majority under continuous contract, roughly 2.72 million. That's 93.1% of all such employees. Another kind of employees, employees we call SDWH employees, roughly 203,000 of them, taking up 6.9% of all employees employed in the non-government sector. And among these SDWH employees, there are, there are further divided into three categories. First, those who usually work for less than 18 hours per week, 155,800 of them, or 5.3% of all non-government employees. The second category, those who work more than 18 hours per week, but as at the date of the survey, worked for less than four weeks, making up 1.3% of all non-government employees. The last category, those who had worked for the current employee for more than four weeks and more than 18 hours per week as at the date of the survey, but not in a continuous fashion. A small number of them, 9,900. That's not 0.3% of all non-government employees. For the 203,500 SDWH employees. Let's look, let's look at the text in purple. Those working for fewer than 18 hours per week. They make up 76.6% of all such SDWH employees. The second category who work for more than 18 hours per week but fewer than four weeks making up 18.6% of all employees, SDWH employees. The last category making up 4.9% of the SDWH employees. Now, a breakdown. Some breakdowns by characteristics. 56.4% of them are females and 43.6% males. A breakdown by age groups. Most of them are in the age group 20 to 29 years old, making up 27% or so. And another age group, 50 to 59, taking up 20.2%. 30 to 
third category, those above the age of 60, making up 17.6% of all SDWH employees. Turning to educational attainment, almost half of them have completed secondary school. As for those who have completed tertiary education, quite a number of them, 38.5% in total. Maybe you want to know what sectors or which industries these people work in. More than a third, that's 36.3%, work in retail accommodation and food services, followed by those in public administration, social and personal services, 23.3%, 16.7% of them work in financing, insurance, real estate, professional and commercial services. As for the occupation, more than 30% in services and sales, and those in the elementary occupations, 24.1%, and those in the managerial executive level, professionals and associate professionals being 17.7%. In the survey, we also found out how they were paid, the mode of payment. Almost half of them were paid by the hour, 46.4%. Those paid by the month or by the week, 25.8%. Those who paid by the day, 24.4%. Well, coming back to this slide, those who usually work for fewer than 18 hours per week, they make up the majority of those on short duration of working hours contracts. We wanted to find out why they would take up jobs where they work for less than 18 hours per week. As you can see in this slide, we have found out some reasons. The vast majority of them, eight, more than 85%, that's 133,900. They didn't try to look for jobs that would take up more than 18 hours per week. And you can also see 5.6% of such employees did try to look for a job, but they failed to find a job they wanted that involved work more of more than 18 hours. And 3.2% of employees also tried to look for the job, work involving more than 18 hours of job. And they tried the job, but they didn't consider the job suitable. And for other factors include their in seasonal temporary work, or there was a industry norm company practice. Now, <clears throat> uh, quite a large proportion consists of workers who didn't go to seek work hours of over 18. And we asked them if an employer uh, will hire them for uh, jobs over 18 hours per week, will they accept it? And then we find that 75 percent uh, that is out of the hundred out of hundred and thirty three thousand nine hundred uh, even if the employer are willing to provide them the jobs over 18 hours uh, per day they still uh, per week they still will not accept it and we try to find out why now uh, over 30 percent uh, they are going to school about 37 percent uh, so they want to work jobs with uh, shorter work hours. And then 27.7% of workers, they have to take care of their families, uh, such as uh, children and uh, elderly. And then over 20%, uh, they uh, believe that they are rather old and they are in retirement, so they choose work hours that are shorter. And then 10% uh, of these uh, show that they want to have a better work-life balance. Now, uh, there are various other reasons, some like 
flexible work mode uh, or jobs with uh, shorter work hours. Some consider their own health. Others, they would like to work, but they don't have the financial need to opt for longer hours. And some want to work, but they don't want to uh, just they don't want to get out of touch with society and that's all they want so they don't need to work long hours. Now for SDWH workers they may not enjoy some of the statutory employee benefits but we find that in fact some of the employers do provide those benefits to them. Now 13.3% they enjoy statutory uh, holidays, 12.8% enjoy an paid annual leave, and 6.5% uh, uh, enjoy year-end payments. Now, uh, in 2009, we did a similar study. Now, this PowerPoint compares the two surveys. Now, for SDWH workers, uh, there, in fact, has been some slight increase. Now, uh, this PowerPoint shows that uh, on the age groups for 15 to 19 and those over 60 age group, uh, the uh, percentage has, uh, uh, in relation to the population has uh, uh, increased quite a lot. <coughs> Question time, uh, Mr. Chen Chen Yang. Now we see several conclusions for SDWH workers. The numbers have increased sharply, and non continuous uh, uh, under on continuous uh, workers, uh, the uh, contract workers, the sh number has increased sharply. So. Uh, now, for those who are under continuous employment, that has decreased, uh, uh, and so the labor market is tight. Now, for the 20 to 29 group, uh, it's 27.1%, uh, and uh, those who are at the golden uh, age group, uh, for those uh, in the uh, um, medium uh, middle age groups uh, uh, they are still many of them are still working short hours so you can imagine the financial situation uh, and for the younger people the 15 uh, to 19 age group they are still going to school so uh, they uh, are undertaking undergoing education so we don't need to worry about them uh, 20 to 29 and 30 to uh, 49 so so many are still working short hours so I don't know whether the government uh, has any way to help them and then the method of survey now the 209 survey that was uh, a more thorough survey this one is a thematic survey now for those who are employed less than four weeks uh, now, uh, now, but whether they want to work over four weeks. Now, now this time, th this question is not asked whether they uh, wish to work over four weeks. Now, is it that you didn't ask this question? Uh, so you, you think the chance of getting work over four weeks is low, so you didn't ask them? So why don't you ask uh, such reference, uh, uh, such questions where you can make a comparison? And you said that the figures cannot be compared directly. Now, if you conduct a survey in the future, will you again use a different methodology? And then you again tell us they can't be compared. So why don't you uh, conduct the surveys in a uh, set or fixed manner so that the findings can be more comparable. 
Now, we uh, have the same concerns for the 15 to 19 age group. Uh, most of them are full-time students. And you might have noted in the PowerPoint that for some workers, they work less than 18 hours. They don't consider uh, long-duration work. Uh, uh, over 35,000, they are full-time students. Now, for other age groups, uh, 20 to 29, uh, also some of them are also full-time students. So we note for that age group, uh, the proportion is rather high. Uh, does the CNS have anything to supplement? Members ask about methodology, so I would supplement. First, there are some employees, now if they work less than four weeks, now in our survey there are questions asking them the reasons. But in our report, uh, we didn't show that because the number of such persons is rather low. So the variance could be larger. So we didn't uh, put that in the report. Now, through the thematic survey, now, in, whereas in 2009, there's a, a general survey, uh, the difference is very minor. The difference is that in this thematic survey, we don't include uh, foreign domestic helpers, whereas the uh, survey 10 years ago, the FDH are included. So on uh, male-female distinction and uh, on the uh, industry differences, uh, this uh, the makes little difference. So we can uh, take note of this uh, in, uh, in our interpretations. Now, when you conduct the next survey, will you include the FDH or would you, uh, be, would you conduct a thematic survey excluding the foreign domestic helpers? We note the members' concerns. Next time when we uh, discuss the methodology, we will uh, discuss with the Census and Statistics Department on this point. So please don't wait too long before you conduct your next survey. Next, Poi Siu Ping. I wanted to ask this question. Why is the uh, survey every 10 years? Uh, is there a set period? Now, in this survey, it's found that female employees are prominent in SDWH, uh, and uh, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the, and then uh, uh, the uh, uh, there are other uh, age groups. Uh, there, there, there's, there's other groupings such as the uh, uh, retail uh, uh, service workers and so on. Now which are prominent in among SDWH. Now, uh, why is the ratio to so high, proportion so high for 20 to 29? Is it uh, due to th uh, the fact that a lot of them are going to university? Now, for the S SDWH workers, uh, they enjoy uh, relatively low share or low uh, of the uh, employees' benefits. So, uh, will you do anything to follow up uh, to offer them more uh, protection? And we understand that this survey now uh, now the uh, SDWH uh, workers tend to fall mainly in the 15 to 19 and then over 60 age 60 age groups. 
Now, I don't know whether the labor market has changed. Uh, now, there are more independent workers. They provide service on their own platforms. So some people might be participating in such work. Or maybe, so maybe the Labor Department and the Census and Statistics Department can focus on uh, this type of workers uh, to show us what is the trend of uh, such uh, uh, participation in the labor market. Why is it that conduct a survey after a relatively long time? Now, the government uh, proposed uh, ways to uh, review the continuous contract for uh, discussion in the uh, Labour Advisory Board and uh, there has been no consensus reached. Uh, so we know that uh, people are interested, still interested in the SDWH uh, workers. So we uh, started this uh, later survey. Uh, we want to find out uh, the mode of such uh, SDWH work and the main characteristics so that the, the government can have the basis uh, to uh, discuss with the labor and uh, uh, sector and the employer sector and the now as for the female workers now the findings show that for continuous con workers in continuous contract, the male to female ratio is 52 to 48. As for SDWH, the ratio is about 44 to 56. So we see uh, that uh, it's not really uh, a large, we don't see a large imbalance. Now on the employee benefits for SDWH workers, now, they don't qualify for the stip uh, benefits uh, stipulated under the employee ordinance, employment, or ordin employment ordinance. But still, uh, some workers provide benefits uh, higher than those uh, under the stipulated under the uh, ordinance. So 13% uh, enjoy uh, the uh, statutory uh, annual, uh, annual leave and so on. Now, so we will continue to encourage the employers to provide such benefits. Now, finally, uh, I have a question. It took 10 years before another survey was commissioned. That's way behind the curve. You should have done it more frequently. Employment patterns will be shifting towards more, maybe more gig workers. One of my questions is this, a question of interest to many. I'm not sure if this was answered in the survey. One thing close to the heart of many now, the continuous employment requirement is about 418, 18 hours or more for four weeks for the same employer, hence the 418 requirement. That's 72 hours if you do the multiplication. Now, if you have employees working for 72 hours, but there are breaks in between every now and then, have you tell the figures on situations like that. Based on the survey results, those who work for more than 18 hours per week, but there are bricks in between situations like this, we see 9,900 such employees. That's not 0.3%. So that's not a common phenomenon. Some organizations 
have their own operational needs, they may be hiring people to complete time limited projects, say exhibitions. They need to keep the flexibility to deal with the volatilities in the market, so they hire short term workers. In accordance with the employment ordinance, under an agreement between the employer and the employee, say there is no work or not enough work in certain weeks, fewer than 18 hours of week work per week, the contract can still be considered as a continuous contract and the employee can still be protected accordingly. We have taken notice of the fact that some employees get benefits as if they were continuously employed. So having bricks between or rather in 18 hours or between four weeks, that's not a common phenomenon. Well, I see, th uh, I have a question based on something that's differently. My question goes like this. People who work 72 hours over four weeks, but the distribution is uneven. So for certain weeks, they work more than 18 hours, but for other weeks, they work less than 18 hours. This is very common with some part-time work. And it's very common. But based on what you said, I think we're talking about different things. If someone has worked for 72 hours over four weeks, that person should already have met the 418 requirement. But now you have this loophole where there are penny pinching employers building in bricks so that the employees don't get 18 hours a week in the fourth week, despite after working for more than 18 hours per week in the previous weeks and hence withholding many employee benefits to the employees. The labor sector has tried hard to pluck the loophole. I emphasize this is a loophole. I don't think this should be or this was part of the design. I don't think you deliberately built into the law such loophole. It's not meant to be part of the design to give a loophole to penny pinching employers. I think the government needs to sit up and come up with a way to pluck the loophole. A few things have been discussed by the labor sector. The first, keep things simple. Someone works 72 hours in total over four weeks, just keep things simple. And the second possibility is that over four weeks, you lower the total hours of work. Or a third option. Can we have a prorata benefits given to employees who do not work 72 hours over four weeks? Maybe this should be discussed at the Labor Advisory Board. In the past, the government has told us that doing away with or relaxing the continuous employment requirement would lead to cost implications for employers and try to scare us. They're saying the government said if we relax the 418 requirement, the employers would have to shed some workers. I'm not happy about the attitude of the Labor Department because the Labor Department has been helping employers to scare employees. And as you said just then, you said 0.3% fall within this category. People work for more than 72 hours over four weeks, but not continuously. That's a minuscule percentage of people. You pluck the loophole, how big of an impact is that going to be? The government should not engage in scaremongering based on data that simply does not stand up to reason. The government should not be there to help employers save costs. The 
employers shouldn't be pinching pennies on these things. Someone works for more than 18 hours for three weeks and fewer than 18 hours for one week. That's not something that's not supposed to be somewhere for employers to achieve savings. The government should plug the loophole, just like how you plug the loopholes in the electoral system. It's something the, the government ought to do. Question for the Labor Department. Can you take this matter, take this matter up? Try to plug the loophole. So that unscrupulous employers, which I believe should be the small minority, cannot exploit the loophole. Can you get this done? Continuous employment means 18 hours of work or more over four weeks. And then the employee would be able to enjoy the benefits under the employment ordinance. That's a pretty low threshold compared to other jurisdictions. But we also noted that it's a balance between rights for employees and something that's affordable for the employers. But what sort of burden are you talking about for employers? The employers will have to factor in the expenses in providing benefits for employees. The 418 requirement, if we relax it, what sort of extra costs would that mean for employers? Let me continue. All that it means is that you're making unscrupulous employers cough up what they should have paid from day one. Many things would have led to an increase in costs, but it's a question of should you, is it something that you should do? The moment you bring up cost increase and it seems like the government is in such a difficult position and not doing things. That's why people think the government is being overprotective of employers. You should take this matter back and have a discussion within the Labor Department. Your response today is no good. You cannot show how big of a cost increase that is for employers. That's something for further discussion. Does anyone wish to speak for a second round on this item? If not, I would want to raise a second question. A question about the survey. Have you interviewed gig workers, those who work for platforms, say those who deliver takeaway food through an app, courier workers who work with an app, gig workers? These are not really self-employed people. Examples from overseas, the people work through an app, the app is a tool the tool is owned by a company. It used the app owned by a company. Of course, this person working for through the app should be counted as an employee. You see more and more common examples of such workers, and they are high-risk workers. Traffic accidents happen with these workers, and they may get into dispute with workers. They get punched by consumer customers. Have you looked into these gig workers? The employers would say these are self-employed people. What's your position on the gig economy and gig workers? Thank you, Chair. A point about reviewing the situation. In our response to Mr. Pun Xiuping, as we said, we would remain in touch with different stakeholders and listen to different views. Now turning to gig workers. The survey in question it's mainly about non-government employees, those aged above 15 and non-foreign -domestic, non domestic helpers. Now, if there are people, gig workers who are not sure if they are employees of the platform, the empl interviewers would put further questions to these people to help them further clarify the matter. 
if they are indeed employees and they would have been covered by our survey. How would you put your question? Our interviewers would ask where this person would have to find business customers himself or herself. Do they have to take the risks of loss or profit? Do they would they have to invest in anything? It make investment decisions, or do they have to own the equipment or apparatus for work? These are just some questions, Chair. Well, these are very complex questions. Some people, some workers may not be able to answer the questions. The key is that you have to address this bogus self-employment and real exploitation phenomenon. These gig workers may be just asked, may be trying to make a bit of extra income, but they are not covered by any employee benefit. Some are just waiting for work to come their way. They are not even entitled to a minimum wage. And that means a huge loophole for employment legislation. Now, this is once again about plugging loopholes. I'm giving you an idea. The Labor Department, the front desk people, whenever they receive these inquiries or complaints about these gig workers, stick up for them, go to court, take people to court if needed. Once you have a couple of judgments, then you have precedents. The same thing happened in overseas jurisdictions. That's how you fight for the employee's benefits. You can't just say it's a matter of perspective. You can't just say, well, I'll leave it to the employees. The, empl the Labor Department cannot be ambivalent about this matter. Or you can ask these workers to come to the FTU. Next, Mr. Holden Chow, please. Thank you, Chair. I see. Chair, you just raised a point about bogus self-employment. Uh, the Labor Department gave us an explanation. Now I'm a lawyer by training and profession. I need to clarify certain points here for the benefit of the public. As in the past, there are judgments, precedents, all kinds of guidelines. Does someone own the equipment? Does the person have to make investment decisions or in a supervisory role. These are things already set out in court judgment. But we need to provide the information in a clear manner to the public. Many of them are not aware of, of how things stand. The employer may have explicitly said that they're not in an employment in the relationship. So the workers take it at face value. But the courts look at an employment relationship differently. The court looks at not just what's stated in the contract, but also the factors we discussed. The Labor Department should look at the information, the guidelines, step up your publicity efforts, and this is something worth doing. A second point, riding on the short-term work or short duration and work hours contract. I want to point out there are emerging sectors say delivery of takeaway food people riding a scooter i don't want to bring up the names we have already seen these frontline food delivery workers there is minimal protection for these workers for example they weren't they didn't enter the relationship as an employment relationship, and there is scant insurance coverage for these people. Hopefully, in cases like these, the Labor Department can show greater care. These are emerging sectors, and they emerge under our current circumstances. And given COVID, many people have turned to such jobs. Of course, we welcome new jobs. But given these emerging industries, we shouldn't be neglecting the safety of these workers. Can we do something to protect these people? 
and it also touches on the self-employment issue. So I want to put forward my thoughts. Hopefully, I can get a response. Assistant Commissioner, now we hear the member. Now uh, people work in uh, different modes as the economy transforms. They want to have flexibility. As for the government, we don't allow employers to uh, use the false uh, self-employment mode to deceive society. Now, irrespective of what's in the contract, if in fact there is an employer-employee relationship, the employer must bear its responsibility under the employment ordinance. Now, as for the platform workers, now this is a new uh, industry, so we will pay attention on this matter, uh, and if necessary, we will discuss with the uh, Census and Statistics Department regarding the survey. Uh, Mr. Chow believes that you want to educate the public on the legal duties. It's not just the work of the labor uh, sector. Now, the government can do too, so a lot too. You can make videos and so on. Now, now SDWH, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a, a widespread loophole situation for employees who are new arrivals in Hong Kong or ethnic minorities, they often fall victim. So you have to step up the work. <coughs> now, uh, for these uh, SDWH uh, situations, now, uh, the four weeks and 18 hours, or, or, or uh, four weeks, 72 hours. Now, some people, uh, many people, they uh, believe uh, they are not full-time workers, but in fact they are. Now, there are several points in this document. In the past, we tried very hard to prevent false self-employment. Now, in many cases, they appear to be self-employment, but in fact there is a, an employer-employee relationship, so the uh, Labour Tribunal has to intervene. Now, the peace uh, rate jobs uh, uh, situation uh, causes confusion. Now, uh, now uh, so the workers, uh, so the employers uh, transform the false of employment situation uh, into a uh, peace rate uh, or uh, 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 in the pre-peace rate work. Now, now the Labour Department should investigate more. Now, uh, the uh, um, members in NETCO or the uh, labor sector in the Labor Advisory Board uh, focus, do focus on this matter uh, and we urge the government to step up uh, labor uh, protection on these peace rate uh, workers. So we should let the public know that the government does uh, take the initiative for instance, in Singapore, the Vice uh, Premier said on TV that uh, after the pandemic, now the peace rate uh, work has increased uh, sharply, so they try to provide uh, more safeguards for the workers. Now, uh, for the SAL government, uh, we should also uh, be proactive and not wait for 
uh, major problems to arise. When will the Labor Department act? We thank uh, Mr. Kwok for his question. Whether we call it uh, for self-employment or uh, peace rate work or platform work, now, now these are new modes of work. And the government is uh, uh, paying attention to this trend. And uh, we also uh, uh, pay due heed to the legislation uh, in uh, other jurisdictions on these matters. <coughs> I'm small, I come. <coughs> so uh, we don't get much uh, uh, that's uh, substantial in the response, but this is not just. Uh, a problem for Hong Kong. It's also happening around the world. Now, you might say we want to see what other jurisdictions do first, but why can't we uh, be ahead rather than be uh, the follower? We are a leading Asian metropolis. Why do we always uh, follow others' examples? We come to the next item for agenda. Item 6, abolition of using employers' mandatory contributions under the MPFS to offset a severance payment and long service payment. We invite Dr. Lo Chi Kwong, uh, Secretary for Labor and Welfare, and his team. Now, this item involves legis proposal. All legislative members are invited to attend. Now, the government uh, provides a document, uh, CB bracket 2, 971-2021, bracket 07. We ask uh, Dr. Law to take us through the document. Thank you. Please be seated first. Uh, Dr. Law. Thank you, Chairman, members. We know on the abolition of the offsetting arrangement since this term of government started its work. Uh, following the previous term, uh, we have started the discussion and in the 2018 policy address, uh, the announcement was uh, uh, made uh, to, uh, regarding the abolition. The arrangement involves government providing for employers uh, as long uh, uh, assistance as long as 25 years to share the burden uh, after the abolition uh, regarding uh, long service award and uh, severance pay. Uh, and we have been following up on the work all along. I don't want to go into details because it's all covered in the document. Now I want to point out that the offsetting arrangement is complex. In particular, uh, this the uh, uh, this uh, retroactive uh, aspect. Now we propose that uh, uh, when we uh, introduce the abolition, there is no uh, retrospective effect. Now, so. Uh, this is a rather a complex issue, and uh, our arrangement, uh, to put it simply, is that before commencement date, uh, the calculation of LP and uh, LSP and SP, uh, the calculation is uh, slightly different from that stipulated in the law. Now, uh, because uh, uh, the, because uh, this uh, it was based on the last monthly wage, and uh, the part that can be offset uh, is uh, uh, based on the wage uh, at on the snapshot so-called snapshot uh, wage amount. So some uh, workers may be uh, may suffer from that. Now, the uh, this approach is uh, uh, feasible, but the government undertakes to bear the uh, difference. Uh, now, uh, so this is a complex issue, and also on the abolition of the offsetting, not everything will be abolished because the spirit 
is to mandate uh, or the mandatory contributions cannot be uh, offset, whereas the voluntary contributions by the employer can be offset, can be used to offset for offset. Now the complexity is regarding the amendment of the legislation. There are eight legis pieces of legislature affected, legislation affected. Uh, so for instance, the MPF scheme, occupational uh, safe, uh, provident, uh, retirement fund scheme, uh, and uh, 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 schools le uh, legislation. And after the offsetting is abolished, uh, the uh, uh, web, uh, the, uh, the, whether the long service pay would be subject to tax, and uh, we will propose to amend the Inland Revenue Ordinance uh, so that there would be uh, a, a tax, deduct tax deduction. And also, to uh, when the employer has to pay uh, SPLSP, uh, now does it have uh, uh, enough uh, cash flow? We propose the government should set up a designated savings account, and that will be a new requirement. And we have to draft a new legislation to uh, deal with the DSA-related legal issues. Now. The DSA, to put it simply, is that 1% uh, uh, of the pay for employees has to be set aside uh, to in, so that uh, uh, it can accumulate to up to 15% uh, of the uh, SPLS pay, day, LSP due. So the em employer uh, will uh, deal with the DSA uh, together with the MPF, so it would be on the same platform, the AE MPF platform. Uh, so uh, the uh, actual management of the DSA. Uh, now we will s uh, s have a uh, back end system to deal with that work. Uh, now the development, the management, and the maintenance uh, would be uh, uh, outsourced. Uh, now, as for the rest of the document, I won't go into the details. Briefly speaking, we are uh, go proceeding full s speed ahead regarding the ten piece legislation uh, for the uh, amendments to be drafted. Our target is that. Within the next uh, uh, legislative uh, term, we will, can table the draft legislation, and uh, when EMPF uh, is commenced, uh, the uh, abolition of the offsetting arrangement will also take effect. Now, uh, it will be an uh, omnibus piece of legislation, but the details are very involved, so we expect that the Bills Committee will have to meet for several months to deal with the bill. So we are still working hard on the drafting, and uh, if, uh, if this term of LegCo will end in December, uh, so it's quite impossible to have enough time to complete the drafting work by that time, and to allow enough time to uh, for the bill's uh, committee to deal with it. So it has to be left to the next legislative term. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Poon Siu Peng to speak. Um, thank you, Chair. I want to thank Dr. Law for saying that the government would go full steam ahead with the effort. The abolition of the offsetting arrangement has is something that the labor sector has been calling for over the years. We expected the last term government to get this done. It didn't work out, and for this ter the current term government, uh, it's unlikely it will work out this time around. For us, the FLU, we just submitted a petition asking the government to deliver on the promise. I have a few questions for the secretary. You said you would submit the bill to the LegCo in the next legislative session. You said there would be seven or oh, in fact 10 pieces of legislation in total 
a key consideration is the EMPF platform, a system that wouldn't be up and running until 2025 at the earliest. In case there are hiccups, the abolition of the offsetting mechanism would be affected. Do you have a backup plan? You also said that so many pieces of legislation need to be changed, including the protection of wages upon insolvency ordinance. You said there would be a designated savings account for each employer. I struggle to understand this. When a business closes down in the future, will the severance pay come from the DSA or from the two-tier subsidy from the government? Does that mean the protection of wages on the insolvency ordinance? Can you tell us what the amendments will be to the PWIO? Another question of interest to many. Once the DSA is set up, if employers breach the regulations, there will be penalties. The maximum penalty being $50,000. And a further breach will lead to $100,000. That's what I see in the paper. For those without an MPF, if you find them $50,000 or those further breached $100,000 and all those jail terms, etc. How do you arrive at the penalty levels? These are my questions for the Secretary. About the protection of wages on the insolvency ordinance. The changes will involve some technical amendments as far as the ab abolition of the offsetting mechanism is concerned. I will show you in due course. These are really technical things. Now, the penalties. How did we arrive at the penalty levels? It's about a balancing act. You have a DSA. We are hoping that, say, an employer has to lay off a number of staff members. The employer has enough money to pay all those severance pays, etc. We don't want to see employers having to close down the business or going bankrupt because of having to pay severance pays. So this is for the benefit or for the protection of both employees and employers. For someone who breached the law, there will be penalties, but we cannot go be too harsh with the penalties. So overall, we are balancing different things in arriving at the penalty levels. We're asking employers to save up for the severance pays. The savings will end up helping the employers pay whatever benefits for the employees. We cannot be too harsh with the penalties. You said it's a balancing act. But just then, you said you would have to amend so many pieces of legislation and then it's going to be so complex. Can you submit the bill at the beginning of the next legislative session? Many in the labor sector are concerned. Can you actually be sure that, say, after the electoral election happens in December and in the beginning of the next legislative session, you can submit the bill. We can only do our level best. Until it goes through the Executive Council, I cannot tell you when we can submit the bill. We will do our best. Next, Mr. Kwok Waikwa. Thank you, Chair. Abolishing the offsetting mechanism is something the labor sector has been fighting for many years. It's a major thing. The sector has been fighting for it. It involves many amendments to the law, 
and complex amendments. Just then, Mr. Pun Ping was saying, this was something raised many years ago, and it took almost two terms of government for deliberation, and there are so many deep-seated conflicts to be resolved in Hong Kong. Does it mean it will take another 10 years? This is close to the heart of many. How can we improve the livelihood of the people? Turning back to this proposal, the government told us the EMPF platform needs to be up and running, which is not expected until 2025 at the earliest. But at other panel meetings, the Secretary of Financial Services and the Treasury wrote in a blog that the EMPF platform is more or less ready for operation in 2023. So why isn't the EMPF up and running in 2023 where we can also have the abolition of the offsetting mechanism? Where's the hold up? Why the discrepancy in the year estimated year of commencement? Do we want the EMPF platform to be up and running sooner or later? Of course, sooner. But can you tell us why? Chair, the Secretary for Food, Financial Services and Treasury was saying that the EMPF platform could be commenced in 2023, but we are talking about full commissioning, and that would be 2025. Give it a thought most employers making MPF contributions. They're making paper-based, they're doing things in a paper-based fashion. In 2023, when the EMPF platform is out, it will take a while for those in the MPF scheme can get things done electronically. from the launching of the EMPF platform to full commissioning, it will take roughly two years. Mr. Kwok Waikar, the problem here is that the sooner the better for employees. Does that mean there is no way for you to have it up and running sooner than 2025? Once the tech is ready, can you fast track certain processes? Can you compress the time it will take? Or is there absolutely no way to have it happen sooner than 2025? Chair, between 2023 and 2025, there are things beyond the control of the government. The pace of digitization is just one of them. And there are so many different MPF trustees, different systems are involved. They need to interface these systems with the EMPF platforms. We need these things to happen before full commissioning can take place. The many different MPF trustees are at different levels of tax savviness. So there are things beyond the control of the government. I give you that example. Say you have an employer. A restaurant, say, he's just using a bucket for wage payment, etc. Imagine the time it takes to go electronic for such a business. Two years sounds like a very optimistic estimate. I'm sure many questions have follow up many members have follow up questions about what you just told us. This issue abolishing the offsetting mechanism has been a source of controversy for many years. I've come into contact with many small and medium enterprises, people from the business sectors. Many have said that and of course, employees want better protection, but they also want a good relationship between employers and employees. 
scrapping the offsetting mechanism. Now, the DAB proposed a central fund or a central pool, and the government has decided against a central fund. Instead, the government is going for a 25-year subsidy. The government will be financially involved in phasing out the offsetting mechanism. Here's my question. Because of COVID and the economy, recovery will be tough. So here's my proposal. Before the government submits the formal proposal, can the government also consider the state of the Hong Kong's economy? Many micro, small, and medium enterprises have said that when they learned about how offsetting would be phased out, they said why don't we just close down before offsetting is phased out or those who are thinking about joining who are trying to start a business to think twice or getting cold feet. In paragraph 14, you said that a review would happen five years into the proposal. Would you be telling the figures on the position of SMEs, changes in SMEs? You have to bear in mind these changes and have your contingency plans. Has the government made any preparations for monitoring how things will change for SMEs, which will certainly be affected in some way? Would you be monitoring how things will be going for SMEs or how new businesses? Will there be ongoing monitoring of how things go? I see that we're almost out of time. So I'm exercising my power as a chairman. I'm extending the meeting for 15 hours. Please, Secretary. Thank you, Chair. In Annex 3 of the paper, we set out our thoughts on the central fund pool. I won't go into detail, but after you read Annex 3, the central pool fund that may actually lead to a greater, much greater burden on employers. We will be hurting them instead of helping employers. The whole plan about the designated savings account will mean the lightest of burden of all options for employers. I get that. Canceling the offsetting mechanism is a complex item. And then we also have to designate the designated savings account and subsidies from the government. Several things are involved. It's tough for SMEs to wrap their heads around all this complex stuff. Of course, the government will have to explain. It. And on the timing raised by a member, uh, we won't have this up and running until 2025. No one has a crystal ball about what Hong Kong's economy will be like in 2025. But the work involved is complex, and it takes a great deal of preparations. And it will take time. If we want to submit a proposal, and that will take several years of time, that will take time. We have to be mindful of what will happen. Whenever it touches on labor rights, it will be tough in bad times and never easy in good times. So does that mean we never have to get things done with labor rights? That's something we have to be mindful of whenever we t are dealing with something that touches on labor rights. So in terms of explanation, we there will be effort in that regard. And in terms of reviewing the arrangement, scrapping the offsetting mechanism, is a major step in labor policy, something comparable to the introduction of the statutory minimum wage. Back then, with minimum wage, 
there were many departments involved. They followed up on the impact. They did all kind of studies and analysis. I see no reason the government would neglect to look at the impact of cancelling the offsetting in terms of labor relations, etc. Next, uh, I have questions myself. I'd like to follow up on uh, Mr. Ho Jin Chow's concern about SMEs. I want I know you want to strike a balance between workers and SMEs. Now, you have good relationship with the SMEs, so please uh, explain to them. Now, the government is uh, spending over $20 billion for subsidies, and the employers have to fork out 1% uh, to put into the DSAs. <coughs> So uh, uh, the uh, so and I believe uh, this plan takes into account the uh, fluctuations in economic cycles. So please uh, explain to employers that they do not to be need to be over concerned, overly concerned. Uh, so uh, I think uh, employers uh, uh, will not uh, f uh, uh, close their business just because uh, of such a change in the policy. Now, uh, so uh, please uh, let us all do more explanatory work. Now, if the economy uh, does deteriorate, then you have to speed up the process because many workers will be uh, 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 dismissed uh, uh, when the economy is bad. Uh, so uh, these are uh, billions of dollars uh, taken out from the MPF, and in the end, uh, the workers have uh, little left for their retirement, and in the end, the government has to pay uh, for the uh, for the gap to make up the gap. Now the government uh, says it regrets it cannot do it within this year, uh, and uh, hopefully we can do it the uh, next legislative year. Uh, now uh, I don't know if the government is indeed uh, strongly uh, determined uh, to. Uh, determined to complete the legislation before uh, July next year, that is the uh, end of the current term of the uh, C Chief Executive. Uh, because uh, this matter has been delayed year after year and the workers are anxiously waiting. Now you said that 10 pieces of legislation have to be amended. Uh, what is the progress right now? If you do not have enough manpower, would uh, Mr. Secretary, would you try to uh, get uh, the Department of Justice to uh, expand its workforce? Now, uh, uh, we don't mind uh, working over time to try to complete the scrutiny of the bill. We want to plug the loopholes in with regard to the MPF. Now, now you tell us that uh, it now depends on the progress of the EMPF. The secretary and the CE are implementing a very important and uh, benevolent policy. This will be a very uh, important uh, achievement for you yourself, Mr. Secretary. Uh, but yet the progress uh, depends on the EMPF. So it seems that an app uh, is uh, tying your hands. So the EMPF might trip you up. Some trustees may not cooperate. They may uh, cause delays uh, so that uh, we can't uh, uh, have uh, the job done by 2025. But in fact, we have uh, many uh, fintech talents. 
Can we speed that up to 2022 or 2023? I'm confident that we can complete the legislation next year. Can you speed that up one or two years? Uh, don't underestimate the importance of the uh, e-platform. Now, under the you know, in the MPF system, there's no central platform. So in the management and administration, uh, the cost is very significant. And that will affect the accumulated benefits of employees uh, because the cost has to be deducted from the investment returns. Now, regarding the DSAs, the situation is similar, especially in the beginning because the employers pay only 1%. Now, uh, right now, uh, now uh, uh, 60% of the MPF payments are done by on paper. Now, if they, uh, that continues uh, for the, if that also applies for the uh, new uh, uh, offset new arrangements, uh, then uh, the efficiency will, will be very much affected. Now, if we abolish the offsetting arrangement, and if that gives rise to a sharp increase in administrative costs, then and if the employers uh, bear the financial burden, ultimately, it will be the employees who will be affected. Now, uh, in developing an information system, there are uh, still a lot of unknowns. Now, so uh, the e-platform uh, will uh, be uh, in preparation till 2023, and uh, it's a uh, very tight timetable and the CE has uh, spelled out the plan in the 2018 policy address and we are still working on that. As I said, there are so many pieces of legislation and the plan is uh, policy, but when you amend the legislation, then you find a lot of uh, linkages and the uh, details that have to be explored. So the work is uh, progressing all along. And uh, Mr. Poon asked a question about the PWIF. Uh, that is quite complex. If the uh, employer goes broke, what would happen? So we have to study the legal arrangements. What would be the most reasonable approach to uh, deal with the DSA savings. So there are many factors for consideration and then the decision can be made to resolve the drafting considerations. So our colleagues uh, have spent, are spending a lot of time and energy on the issues and the department's concern. Uh, for instance, at the DOJ, uh, there are uh, units that deal with the problems such as privacy, uh, the relationship between the management and the trustees and the employers, uh, the information flows, all these have to be explored in depth. Uh, otherwise, uh, when the legislation draft is presented, the problems will arise. So please don't uh, ever say that we uh, are trying to delay the work. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just uh, asking whether you can speed it up. Mr. Shu Kafai, we are discussing abolition of the uh, offsetting arrangement regarding the MPF. Now, I don't use the word offsetting. I don't know who thought of that, who, who came up with that. Now, for the business sector, Uh, we are less vocal than the labor sector. 
uh, the employers can only uh, express the uh, 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 their uh, disappointment now. <coughs> Uh, many senior businessmen tell me that when you set up the MPF system, uh, they, when the, this MPFS was first set up, uh, the uh, payments uh, they were told would include the uh, SP and uh, LSP, uh, but now uh, you change, you're moving the goalpost. So uh, the uh, many SMEs uh, are on the verge uh, of uh, having to uh, vote uh, now, and uh, there will be more uh, legal members uh, who would represent the labor sector uh, and the less members in the business sector. Now many businesses are folding. Uh, many uh, want to are, are getting ready uh, to close up shop. Uh, now, if you want them to close shop earlier, uh, if you uh, want to send more people into the uh, unemployment queues, then uh, uh, by all means. Uh, 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 push ahead. Now the SMEs are uh, over 90 percent of uh, uh, of our establishments are SMEs. Uh, they may uh, uh, employ a few people for uh, they have been long time employees. Uh, now, uh, now, well, if the government uh, puts the uh, burden the retirement uh, burden on the business sector, uh, the business sector, uh, the SMEs may have uh, may end up having to close up shop. Now, when the economy is bad, then uh, uh, in fact you shouldn't raise the matter. Now, but. But uh, uh, the uh, somebody still say that uh, 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 the uh, offsetting arrangement issue shouldn't be raised when the economy is good. Who said that? When the CE uh, announced the plan in 2018, the economy was doing quite well. Uh, now, but let's not dwell on that. Now, for. On, on abolition of the offsetting arrangement, uh, that is uh, uh, the uh, offsetting of the uh, contributions, MPF contributions uh, against the uh, SP and LSP. Now, uh, the impact is less than uh, one percent, and uh, the government will provide uh, uh, nearly thirty billion dollars. Uh, as subsidy uh, over uh, uh, over uh, next uh, twenty years, uh, so uh, uh, this is, this would not be a difficult adjustment for the business sector. Now, uh, but the issue is com the issues are complex, uh, and uh, actually the uh, impact on the uh, uh, business environment is very minor. I think if people understand more about the policy, uh, the uh, concerns would be alleviated. Now we have been talking to many chambers of commerce. Uh, after a couple of meetings, uh, there is uh, great, uh, much greater understanding. Uh, the time is about up. We hope that the uh, secretary. Uh, is uh, uh, able to uh, move ahead uh, 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 rapidly with the progress. I believe the business sector uh, would uh, does, doesn't have to worry. 
so we come to the end of this discussion. Uh, item number seven, uh, AOB. If there is no AOB, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Uh, we thank the uh, of members and the officers who are here. Thank you. <coughs>